some time ago I did a video sculpting up a skull from Monster Clay and a bit later on I also did a video where I textured the skull using some texture stamps I created. Um, since then the sculpture just sat on the shelf not really doing much so I really wanted to do something with it. So in this video I'm going to be making a mould of the skull and then casting up some resin copies. The weather's got a little cold at the time doing this, so I've actually brought all of the uh, stuff I need into the house this time. The temperature can have an effect on the way that silicon and resin cures, and so for that reason I'm going to be doing the mould inside the house. It's just best to do it at a room temperature if you can. Obviously pouring silicon all over the floor or over the work surface probably isn't a great idea, so I've taped down some tin foil here just to try and protect things. So the first step is to weigh out some silicon and catalyst to make my mould. And the silicon I'm using here isn't super expensive. I don't intend this mould to be something that I'm going to be producing hundreds of casts from. It's just to make a few casts for my own purposes. So it's going to be a little bit rough and ready. I'm not going to spend too much money on it. So I'm mixing my catalyst and silicon together and I'm being careful here not to sort of push it over the sides of the mixing cup. I probably should have used a larger cup here really, but I really like these things. They're condiment bowls from a restaurant supplier shop and they're just really, really useful. So I tend to use them quite a lot. Um, so right, I've got that mixed up. So what I'm going to be doing here is using a method that I've used in previous videos and that is to add a layer of silicon over the sculpture by introducing it to the top and allowing it to drip down. I'm then going to be using an airbrush to blow the silicon into the details of the sculpture. That way I don't on the risk of sort of stabbing the sculpture with a sculpting tool uh, if I were to try and move this around manually. So the trick here is to add some silicon to the top of the sculpture, let it drip down, and as you do, sort of slowly rotate the sculpture and just keep introducing the silicon back to the top to allow it to drip down again. As the silicon cures, it will slowly slow down until it gets into a position where you don't have to worry about it anymore. Now this layer of silicon is going to be the detail layer, so I'm just taking my time to make sure that I get all of the detail of the sculpture covered. What you don't want is air bubbles in cavities or details, things like that. So you just want to make sure that you accurately capture all of the detail of your sculpture in the silicon. So I find that turning the sculpture upside down and slowly rotating it is a good way to keep the silicon flowing uh, whilst also making sure that not too much of it ends up on the floor or on the work surface. Now obviously as you can see some of it's dripping off here and that's fine because I've layered down a layer of foil. I can actually scrape that back up again and reintroduce it onto the sculpture if I want to. But I find it's quite a cool way of doing sort of um, simple moulds. Um, as long as you use a small amount of silicon each time it's not too difficult to manage. Obviously this would be quite difficult if you were pouring litres of the stuff over the sculpture, but if you do it a little bit at a time I find that's quite manageable. And it's really just a case of slowly rotating the sculpture and waiting for the silicon to cure. Right, so my first layer of silicon has now stopped flowing, so what I can now do is mix up a second batch and introduce that as well. Now like I said, the first layer is really there to capture all the detail, so now that I've done that, the next layer is really to start bulking up the thickness. What you don't want is a layer of silicon to be too thin and for the mould to uh, deform or tear. Um, so it's good to have a decent level of thickness to the mould. So what I'm going to do here is mix up a second batch of silicon. What I'm actually going to do this time is add something called a fixotropic additive. And all that does is thicken up the silicon and make it a bit more paste-like. So that way it doesn't flow quite so quickly. And you can sort of paste it on. And it's really good for just increasing the thickness of the mould. So I'm going to paste it on with a tongue depressor here and I'm just going to be very careful not to introduce air into cavities like the eye sockets when I push the silicon in. So a good way to do that is just to introduce the silicon quite slowly so there's time for the air to escape from the cavity as you do it. And the plan here is to just slowly build up the layer of silicon until you've got something that's of decent thickness. What you want to make sure is that the um, cavities and the sort of um, undercuts of the sculpture are actually filled in with silicon so that you've got basically a ball of silicon. And what you don't want is things like the cheekbones sort of showing because what I'm going to be doing is adding a layer of fiberglass over this and that's to hold the silicon in shape once I remove the sculpture. 
So what you don't want is undercuts, which can actually lock on that jacket. And if you don't pay attention to that sort of thing, you can sometimes lock your sculpture into the mold, which can be a bit of a disaster, because the only way to get it out is to either break the sculpture or break the mold. So um, that happens to me sometimes, and it's a bit of a pain, but you sort of learn to avoid those things um, with experience. So the last stage I'm doing here is using some white spirit, which is like a paint thinner, uh, on a tongue depressor. I'm just using that to smooth out the silicon. Like I said, I'm going to be adding a layer of fiberglass over this to hold it all in shape. And what you want is a sort of a smooth finish to the silicon as well as you can get it. Um, what you'll need to do once you've removed your sculpture from the mold is to put the silicon back into the fiberglass shell. And if you've got lots of little protrusions and weird things on the surface of the silicon, it can make it difficult to put it straight back into the fiberglass jacket. So having a smoother finish is you can get is really useful. Right, so there's my finished layer of silicon, and we're actually back in the workshop this time. Although it's still a bit cold, and um, what I'm going to be doing is making a fiberglass jacket, as I said. And the way you do fiberglass is to laminate some glass fiber with some polyester resin, and that does have quite a strong chemical smell, so best to do it outside the house. So the first step here is to actually create a cardboard uh, divide. What this is going to do is just to allow me to create a natural divide between the two halves of the fiberglass jacket. So as you can see I'm hot gluing the cardboard onto the silicon and the hot glue isn't going to stick to the silicon. I mean that's why silicon is really used for mold making because nothing sticks to silicon except for silicon. Um, so the hot glue won't actually adhere to it but what it will do is sort of form a layer over the silicon and allow it to sit on there and that should be good enough for my purposes. So I'm just going to slowly build up a surround over this and also add some tape to hold it in place. As you can also see I'm adding some keys on here as well on the edges and that's just so that the two halves of the fiberglass jacket can go together in one way and they won't misalign. So I'm now ready to create my fiberglass jacket. So what I'm doing is cutting out some pieces of glass fiber and I'm also mixing up some polyester resin. Now as I mentioned, this stuff has a very strong chemical smell so it's a good idea to do it outside. It's also a good idea to wear a respirator as well. This stuff is sticky, stinks and is quite toxic so it's not the best stuff to use but nevertheless it is cheap and it is quite versatile so I do find myself using it quite a lot. Unlike some polyurethane resins and various other types of resin, this isn't a one-to-one -one mix. You actually measure up a small amount of catalyst and add that to the resin, and that's what causes it to cure. So once that's mixed up, it's really just a case of laminating the glass fiber with the resin and building up a decent thickness. If you use a silicon brush, um, you can actually peel the cured resin off it once it's dry. So that's a good way of having something that's reusable. If you were to just use a paintbrush, it would be completely ruined by the time you were done. Right, so now that's cured, I can take away the cardboard and I can now do the second half of the fiberglass jacket. Now you do need to make sure that the two halves of the fiberglass don't stick together. So in order to prevent that, what I'm doing is to add a layer of Vaseline as a separating agent. Another way of doing this might be to line this side of the mold with tape, just so that the fiberglass doesn't stick to itself. So there are a number of ways of doing this. And for the second half, it's the same process as before. Just build up a number of layers of fiberglass to create a decent thickness. Now as well as the polyester resin being toxic, sticky, uh, having a very strong chemical smell, the cured fiberglass is also a little bit dangerous as well. You can get some very sharp edges and it's also a bit of a skin irritant if you uh, cut it as well. So it's, it's quite nasty stuff. So what I'm doing is to give it a quick sound, that's just to get rid of any splinters and any sharp edges. It's a good idea to wear gloves with this stuff because it can be quite easy to cut yourself and I, I have done that a number of times. So it's now just a case of getting a screwdriver between the two halves of the jacket and slowly leaving them apart. This can sometimes feel like it's not going to come apart at all, but it's really just a case of slowly easing it apart. And eventually, once it reaches a certain point, it will just separate very easily. Right, so there we go. So now it's just a case of freeing my sculpture from the silicon. So I'm just going to tidy up the edges slightly, and I can then cut the back of the silicon to free the sculpture. So it's now just a case of putting the silicon back into the fiberglass jacket and then I have a mould ready to use. <laughs> 
So what I'm going to do is actually mix up some more polyester resin here and use that to rotocast some skulls. So that involves sloshing the resin around the outside of the mould and as it cures it sticks to the outside and gives you a hollow cast. In order to get a bone-like colour to the resin, what I'm doing is adding some white polyester pigments to the resin. And that's just like a concentrated colour in a paste, which you can mix in. You only need a tiny amount to colour it. Now there are a number of polyurethane resins as well which are specifically made for this, but I've chosen polyester for a particular reason. One of the many drawbacks of it is it does cure quite brittle, and that's normally not a desirable thing, of course that's why you laminate glass fibre into it to give it some additional strength, but in this case I do want it to be brittle and I'll show you why in a sec. Now although the polyester resin does work quite well for roto casting, it does take ages to dry. A lot of the polyurethane resins which are specifically intended for this purpose sort of go off in a few minutes, but this took about 15 minutes to cure so it did feel like I was rotating the mould for ages, but eventually it did set, so I'm now ready to freely cast from the mould. And another feature of polyester resin is also that it shrinks as it cures, so what I found was as I was taking this out was that it had actually come away from the edges of the mould a little. Um, not really a problem for this, you know, you're not going to notice it too much, but for some applications it may be a problem so again another drawback of polyester resin but nevertheless this stuff is cheap and it's readily available and so I do find myself using it quite a lot So once I had a successful cast, I started thinking about what else I could do with the mould and of course I have had a go with some cold casting previously and that involves pouring metal powder into resin to get a metallic sheen to your cast. So I couldn't resist doing the same with this mould, so this is a cold cast skull in brass and obviously it looks a bit dull at the minute but once you give it a sand down with some wire wool and a polish you can actually get quite a nice metallic look to it. So as you can see I'm just having to go on the polishing wheel here and then giving it a further hand polish and that's come out with quite a nice sheen to it so I'm quite, I'm quite pleased with that. So what I now want to do is give my skull a slightly more bone-like finish. So what I'm going to do is take some brown oil paint here and I'm going to use a old toothbrush to push the paint into all the little details of the skull. So I'm just making sure I've got this thing completely covered with uh, brown paint. I'm actually using a uh, burnt umber here, so it's a slightly orangey sort of colour. But once I've got that all covered, I'm then going to wipe it away with a cloth, which I've got a bit of paint thinner on. And as you can see, as that goes away, the paint remains in the smaller details of the skull. And that really sort of makes all of those details stand out. So it's quite a nice, easy way of getting a decent paint finish on this quite quickly. As a final step, I'm just going to add some black into the eye sockets as well to give a bit of shading. So that's looking pretty cool, so I actually did quite a few of these as you can see in the photo. The skull in the middle is made from polyurethane resin and that's sort of like my master skull, the, uh, the main one. The others though are made from polyester resin and as I said I chose that for a very specific reason, that's because it's quite brittle. And the reason I wanted that is because of this. So you may be wondering why I've gone to the trouble of casting all these things up only to smash them to pieces. Well, what I actually want to do is to take some still images of the skulls and for that I want to have some shattered skulls to create some interesting images. So I've broken two of these apart and I'm going to cut a third one in half. And what I want to do is photograph each of these elements separately and then composite some images together to create some interesting images. What I also did was to take these pieces and glue them together on a framework so I've got a sort of a sculpture of a skull that's shattered in pieces. And once I photoshop all of these white elements out of the way it does actually look kind of cool. So I do think skulls are actually quite versatile, you can use them for quite a number of things and actually while I was making this video I found this image online of a sort of a um, cyborg skull, maybe it's the skull of a Borg from Star Trek or a servo skull from Warhammer 40,000 but I do quite like the look of that and I do happen to have a load of old uh, small security cameras uh, that someone gave me a while back so I'm thinking maybe I could make myself a sort of cyborg skull as well. So like I said these things are quite versatile and I think the sort of things you can do with them are pretty much endless so quite useful to have a mould of a skull 
skull in your collection uh, just in case you want to do something like that but anyway i hope this was interesting um, it's just a small project that i occupied a saturday afternoon doing but it's produced some nice results i think so i hope that was useful and thanks very much for watching and i'll see you next time Thanks very much for watching. I'll be posting videos on future projects, so if you'd like to keep up with what's going on, please do subscribe. Alternatively, you can visit my website, which is www.thedarkpower.com, or you can find me on Facebook, just search for The Dark Power.